so uh, soy historia de Brasil del Brasil. Yeah? Entonces uh, yo hablo español como brasileño. De verdad no hablo español, hablo hablo portugués. So I'm going to uh, speak in English with the help of a translator. I promise to speak slowly uh, because it'd be better than you all pretending you understand my Portuguese. <laughs> Uh, also, I want to just make an apology for my informal dress. I brought a jacket with me and a tie because it's snowing where I live. And when I got here, uh, it is probably, what, 40 degrees warmer, so I was dressed inappropriately. You seem to understand English. Okay. So also, I can't really see my slide so much, so I may be off, but I just want to talk today about this issue of global history. And as you can see from the title, the topic of globalization and global history implies in its name the globe, the planet. But what I want to argue as a historian of the Western Hemisphere, as someone who's writing a book, I've written two books on Brazil, but now I'm writing a book called The Global Twenties, which is about the 1920s in the Americas. And I define the Americas as including Canada, and the United States, and Mexico, and Central America, and the Caribbean, and South America. And so what I want to argue is that it's wrong to think that that's going to work. It's wrong, ah, it's wrong to think of global history as having to be global. And perhaps to a room full of Peruvians who are studying uh, the history of Peru in the context of South America, the context of Spanish colonialism, the context of British and later U.S. imperialism, it's not odd to hear someone say what I'm saying. But the fact of the matter is there are scholars who say you can't write a global history of not the globe. So what I want to talk about today are a couple of themes. Global history and its critics, the, the promises and the critiques, the process of globalization, this thing we talk about all the time. And I am an American, which means that uh, you may see me and my family here if Donald Trump is reelected. Uh, so he's someone who is challenging globalization, certainly. And I want to talk about what we think about as the Americas. So first, I want to define global history. I don't know if any of you have read this book. If it's in Spanish, I know many of you read English. But Sebastian Conrad wrote a very good book called What is Global History? If you're familiar with that. And there's lots and lots of thinking about what it is. On the most basic level, when we say global history, whether we're talking about Lima, whether we're talking about this university, or whether we're talking about the production of coffee, we always want to have a global context. We want to know the broader na nature of things. So what this German, I think he's German, historian has talked about is that there are three basic components to global history. Global history, do you need to? No. Do you? Okay. Lo que el profesor nos quiere hablar es de el problema de lo global que nosotros inevitablemente vemos como que el título va a implicar al globo entero. Para él. Lo que él va a tomar como las Américas dentro del globo va a incluir a Canadá, Estados Unidos, el Caribe, Sudamérica. Eh, y tenemos que entender para él que es erróneo pensar la historia global como solo eh, totalitariamente lo que implique el globo, sino que eh, como peruanos tal vez nos puede costar entender eh, esto, pero es por eso que él nos va a explicar este, el caso particular que, que él va a tomar. ¿No? Y por ejemplo, él menciona un caso eh, suyo de que para él eh, Donald Trump eh, él reta a la globalización. Y él está tomando para el, el título de la ponencia de la globalización no es planetaria. Eh, no sé, está tomando este autor, Sebastián Conrad, en qué es la historia global, eh, la historia del todo, primero. Okay, so let's just actually try to say, so, so if I were to say this in Portuguese, I'd say, eh, eh, a historia de todo. A historia de conexiones, ¿eh? a historia que tiene por centro 
a ideia, a ideia de conexões. E a ideia mais importante para mim na, em, em uh, Global History é que a ideia de estudo é um uma tipo de estudar história. Né? É o sujeito e metodologia, right? The subject matter and the methodology. So Portuguese and Spanish aren't such distant neighbors, right? Okay, we're understanding some of that. And to me, para mim, essa é a mais, mais importante, é? Yeah? The subject matter is half of it, that we're studying uma coisa mundial, uma coisa com conexões mundiais, mas também a metodologia é a ideia de pensar globalmente. <laughs> You're gonna have nightmares tonight. Was that English or Portuguese? <laughs> I love torturing my students. Why shouldn't I come to South America and torture you? Joel, Silvia can help in your translation. Every slide you want to do? Yes. Okay. Um, el profesor quiere tomar a partir de Sebastián Conrad eh, pequeños conceptos como la historia del todo, la historia de las conexiones eh, y también eh, tener presente la clave eh, dentro de la historia global al objeto de estudio y la forma como estamos estudiando eh, la historia ¿no? y para eso es muy importante tener eh, en consideración el el sujeto de, de, de importancia que estamos estudiando y la metodología. So, you don't have to translate this, but some of you will understand. So, Conrad specifically says in his book, the aim is not to write a total history of the planet, it is more often a matter of writing a history of a demarcated, that is not global space, but with an awareness of global connections and structural conditions. And an important idea that I want to play with, and I think it's impo particularly important in Peru to think about this, is that one of the ideas of global history is to decenter our analyses of the world, to move away from a Eurocentric or US-centered view. I totally agree with that. But I worry that when you do that, when you diminish the role of the center in your analysis, you diminish your analysis of the power of the center and the power of imperialism. And so in my book, which I'm going to talk about uh, tomorrow, I do focus a great deal on the United States. Okay. So there are two eras of modern globalization. The first is from about this 1870s, rough date. Some people will date it with the real establishment of the gold standard. And it has a real drop dead date, although I challenge that, of the beginning of World War I. What made, before we get to this, what made it an era of globalization? Revolutions in transportation, the railroad, steamships, refrigeration, so that places like Argentina could send fresh beef to Europe, not jerked beef or salted beef, right? The rise of the gold standard. What's the point of the gold standard? That when you're selling guano or copper or coffee or sugar in Peru, a price is being quoted in London, and we understand that the exchange takes place, that the Peruvian currency of the day, the Brazilian currency, the Mexican currency, is pegged to one thing. It's pegged to gold, which makes transactions easier and more frictionless. There is a dramatic increase in the volume of world trade. We say that it ended in 1914 because it was brought to a halt by World War I, but within the Western Hemisphere, there was a lot of trade in the 1920s that's brought to a stop by the Great Depression. So worldwide, this is the date. In the Western Hemisphere, it's a little different. The second era of globalization is a little harder to wrap your mind around. Because it really begins right after World War II. U.S. hegemony and the promotion of capitalism, primarily because of the Cold War. The United States not only wanted to have American businesses do well and have new markets, but 
But to challenge the Soviet Union did that. And the dollar, of course, replaces the pound sterling for the gold standard until the 1970s. There's the next generation of transportation, what we're familiar with today, container shipping, cheap air travel, that fresh fruit and flowers from Colombia and Peru and, 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 uh, and Chile are in U.S. markets because of these revolutions. Revolution in technology, we're all familiar with, of course, the internet, the cell phone, inexpensive telephony, GAP, the general agreement on tariffs and trade, to, to deepen this, the European Union, NAFTA. And it's challenged by, of course, Brexit and Donald Trump. But I do want to say, in a room of Peruvians, that the beginning date is hard, because much of Latin America, from the 1930s until the 1980s, did practice internal national development and industrialization, and often had barriers to trade. And so really, globalization takes off in the Western Hemisphere in the 1980s with neoliberalism in Mexico. It's like gravity. You can't oppose gravity. 
and Dori Massey Davos is in Switzerland. She looked at President Clinton and she said, how did you get here? And he said, what do you mean, how did I get here? And she said, what mode of transportation did you take? And he said, I flew in an airplane. She said, you defied gravity. But the point is, she was saying is, there's nothing inevitable or natural about globalization. Eh, la globalización es difícil de decir de dónde vino. Eh, tiene que ver con la expansión de las, de las economías y con los procesos sociales que vienen con ellos. Eh, es visto como algo natural, pero, por ejemplo, el profesor cuenta una anécdota de que Bill Clinton se encontró con una geógrafa británica eh, que le, le cuestiona eh, eh, esto de la globalización y de por qué es natural. Y él le dice, es como la gravedad, es algo natural que no puedes evitar es algo que simplemente va a pasar. Y esta geógrafa le dijo, eh, bueno, señor Clinton, presidente Clinton, ¿cómo fue que usted llegó aquí? Y le dijo, bueno, vine en un avión. Y le dijo, entonces usted ha retado la gravedad y aún así ha podido llegar. Entonces tenemos que ver la globalización como algo que sí puede desafiar, al, que, no, que no es natural, sino que está desafiando. Well, the next term I want to define is the Americas, and that might seem dumb. But what I can tell you is when I was a student, when I was your age, I studied in Guadalajara, Mexico. And I told someone I was an American. And the Mexican said, well, we're Americans. Tu eres norteamericano. So the first time I went to Brazil, and I had to sign something saying what my nationality was, I wrote norteamericano. And the Brazilian said, u senor é canadense. Right? You're Canadian. I said, no, I'm from the States. And they said, entonces, down. We'll say American. So it depends where you are. And if you ask a Canadian if they're an American, they'll get mad at you and say they're not. So there's a politics. But I think that in academia, in college, and in writing, when we divide into Latin Americanists and Americanists, people who study the United States, and Canadians, we ignore the actual history that goods and people and ideas and money have moved among these three categories. There's nothing in practice of an economy or politics or migration, human migrations. We have a large Peruvian population in the United States. I have a colleague who is one of the great young historians of Brazil. His father is Brazilian, his mother is Peruvian, and he grew up in Los Angeles, and now he teaches in Tennessee at Vanderbilt. So in reality, these are fake divisions. It has to do with how academic departments and grants are broken up that we divide these things up. Para el profesor, él piensa que para nosotros puede ser un poco difícil tener que definir lo que es las Américas. Él cuenta la anécdota de que cuando estudió en Guadalajara, esta cuestión de historia, al igual que nosotros en nuestra, a nuestra edad, eh, le preguntaron, ¿tú de qué nacionalidad eres? Y él le dijo, yo soy americano. Y los mexicanos le dijeron, pero nosotros también somos americanos. Entonces, eso le generó una confusión. Pero cuando fue a Sao Paulo y él tuvo que llenar una ficha que decía de qué nacionalidad es, él puso eh, norteamericano. Y él le dijeron, eres canadiense. Entonces, es, puede generar una confusión esto de por ejemplo también decirle un canadiense que es este, un americano, para ellos no es lo mismo. Entonces, eh, para él depende mucho de dónde uno eh, viene para poder eh, sentirse o llamarse a sí mismo un americano. Pero eh, nosotros eh, estamos perdiendo más que ganando, si estamos eh, dividiendo los estudios eh, en una hemisferia entre los latinoamericanos, eh, los americanistas y los canadienses, simplemente. Actually, so, I want to, well, I'll say some things that aren't on this slide. So, part of this, and this is, I'm going to skip this. this is, you don't need to know. It's kind of boring. Okay. So, there are critics of the so-called global term. And the criticism is that, like all new things in academia, it seemed to try to answer every question. Global history was looking beyond what was going on in Lima 
or in, in Santiago, or in a small town in, in Juan Cabalica. It wasn't paying attention to that. It was ignoring local histories. It was also critiqued as being another fact, just a new way of doing things. Now, I started writing this book before Brexit, before Donald Trump, but that doesn't mean that this book isn't fattish, because I am dealing with challenges to globalization. But if some of your history majors, and a lot of your history majors, we know that studying the peasantry in the United States became a very important thing during Vietnam, because the United States was fighting against peasants. Studying slavery became a very important thing in the United States as the United States went through its civil rights movement. The rise of second, what we call second wave feminism brought about gender studies and the broader societal embrace of divergent sexualities, where it's now legal in the United States for you know, men to marry men and women to marry women. That's led to sexuality studies. So one of the critiques is that it's re responding to, this, to today and using the today to look at the past, but I would argue that that's true of almost everything. Eh, una de las críticas a, a los estudios eh, globales, eh, por ejemplo, él lo comienza con una anécdota de que este libro él lo, lo empezó a escribir eh, antes del Brexit y antes de que Trump ganara. Entonces, eh, para él una crítica es que eh, cómo podemos estar respondiendo a preguntas del pasado con coyunturas en el presente y él pone varios ejemplos de eh, cómo la lucha eh, del feminismo tuvo que ver mucho con el incremento de los estudios de género eh, como por ejemplo eh, la guerra civil por, eh, por mm, liberar a los negros de la esclavitud en Estados Unidos tuvo que ver mucho con estudiar esta clase de temas entonces eh, no es caprichoso, no es parish eh, el término es caprichoso, no es caprichoso eh, decir que se tenga que tomar la la coyuntura para explicar el pasado, sino que muchas veces nos sirve para, para explicar. So the argument is that I'm looking at the Americas as a global system in my work. So why does it make sense? We always Latin America makes sense, right? Settled, conquered by the Spanish and the Portuguese. Even though they took different paths, most of Latin America became independent at the same time in the 1820s. So we can find a coherence in Latin American history. That makes sense. But I would argue that the entire Western Hemisphere shares these components. A shared history of conquest, settlement, and colonialism. Only recently do American historians and Canadian historians admit that there was a conquest in North America. The independence movements and the processes of nation building were also very, very similar. And all we, in South America, when people look at the United States and Canada, they don't see major commodity producers. Canada and the United States are major commodity producers. At the time of the U.S. Civil War in 1865, the majority of America's wealth was in slaves, and those slaves were producing commodities for export. So it looked a lot like Brazil. And another thing that connects the Americas is elite and middle class consumption, that you and my students are really not that different. El profesor ve las Américas eh, como un sistema global eh, donde nosotros somos un lado occidental que comparte varias características aquí mencionadas. Todos compartimos eh, un medio territorial que ha sido conquistado donde tanto españoles como portugueses se asentaron y que eh, practicaron el colonialismo. ¿no? Eh, en los movimientos independentistas y los procesos eh, construyeron a las naciones que hoy día conocemos Eh, se comparte que, por ejemplo, eh, países como Canadá hayan sido productores de eh, productos de incomodidades y la exportación de esta clase de productos 
y uh, ha tenido una constitución de una clase media y de una élite, que es una clase alta. So I want to use the case of Brazil to make my point. One of the things that differentiates Brazil from most of the other countries in the Americas is that colonial Brazil existed almost as a reaction to other nations rather than as part of a plan. So you know, as Peruvians, that the Spanish came to Peru, of course, for money, but they also came for Christianity. They came for souls, right? And the, the Indians were the children of, God, of uh, the king. So yes, Brazil was about commodities. Brazil is named for its first export, Brazil. But Brazil was also a reaction to foreigners. I, I would guess that most of you don't know this, that the north of Brazil, the state of Pernambuco, was Dutch. The south of Brazil was Spanish. And present day Rio de Janeiro, has anyone been to Rio de Janeiro? There is a beer and a soda company called Antarctica. And I thought when I first got to Brazil, Antarctica was about how cold the beverage is. That's part of it. But Rio, during the colonial period before the Portuguese gained control of it, was French Antarctica. So the Portuguese came into Brazil to protect it from becoming parts of other things. So it was always a kind of global and regional relationship to everything else. There wasn't a kind of thinking about Brazil at first. There was a thinking about other places. Eh, el profesor ya empieza a tomar el, el caso de, de Brasil que no solamente se dedicaba a la producción de eh, esta clase de productos de comodidades eh, sino que también estaban divididos diferentes eh, zonas, por así decirlo que producían diferentes eh, productos por ejemplo, había una zona eh, holandesa en el, nore en el noreste una zona española en el sur inclusive una francesa en lo que ahora se considera Río de Janeiro, cada uno eh, produciendo diferentes productos. Y esto se da, según el profesor, porque el colonialismo en Brasil nace como una reacción y no como un plan. Los portugueses llegan a, a lo que es ahora Brasil, eh, no con el plan de colonizar, sino para evitar que eh, otros, otros países u otras, eh, otros pequeños grupos lleguen a Brasil a colonizar a pesar de que aún pasó que existían holandeses eh, produciendo cada uno de diferentes productos como eh, los franceses produciendo eh, helado creo que... sí, eso. So Brazil has always been by definition transnational it's named for its first export labor was dominated by slavery but the slaves were coming from Portugal's other colonies, Angola and Mozambique Many of you probably don't know this, but the Portuguese never hesitated to enslave Indians. They would simply claim that the Indian was mixed blood, African and Indian, and therefore could be enslaved. Another fact that I'm wondering if you know as Peruvians is that you do know that the independence movements in South America began after Napoleon invaded Spain. But when Napoleon was in Spain, the Portuguese royal family understood he was coming next to Portugal, and so the Portuguese royal family came to Brazil in 1808. Brazil is the only time, is the only place where a colony became the seat of a European imperial nation. So Portuguese seaborne empire in, the, in the Asia and Africa was governed from Rio de Janeiro, inverting the metropole colon, uh, colony relationship. So the global context has always defined Brazil long before it produced sugar, well, long before it produced coffee for the world economy, long before it produced airplanes that are sold all over the world. As a nation, it's always been transnational, and that's part of the call for this kind of globalism. Eh, Brazil, eh, para el profesor, es por definición transnacional, eh, muy conocida por la exportación de su madera, por ejemplo y él cuenta un dato un poco curioso, ¿no? que los indios eh, no eran 
considerados esclavos en sí mismos, sino que eran vistos como una mezcla entre eh, con los esclavos negros y por eso los indios eran considerados esclavos, no porque en sí mismos eh, fueran eh, esclavos. Entonces, eh, esto a la vez en todo el periodo de colonización eh, hizo que Brasil fuera la única sede de un imperio europeo en esta parte de nuestro, de nuestro territorio. Eh, fue una labor dominada predominantemente por esclavos africanos que venían de Angola y de Mozambique. Eh, eh, sí, sí. So one of the arguments that I want to make is that nation building, the process of going from a colony to a nation, has also been global. Here in Peru, obviously, it starts with Guam. But in Canada, Canada was primarily a fur-producing country. In fact, I, I, almost no one knows this in the room. The national animal of Canada is the beaver, because beaver pelts. Okay. Yeah, beaver pelts were the main export of Canada. The United States was heavily dependent on commodity production and export. As I said, at the time of the U.S. Civil War, the most of the American wealth was in cotton, sugar, and tobacco production, not in the rising industry in the North. So all of 19th century the Americas were dependent on commodity production and export to Europe. Um, la, la crea la creación de una nación como, como algo global, eh, la hemisferio, las naciones de la hemisferia occidental eh, se han recostado en producir productos de, de comodidad y en exportarlos. En el caso peruano, para el profesor tiene que ver con la producción del guano y eh, con eh, la exportación de pieles canadienses. ¿no? Esto, esta clase de comercios eh, y la, com la comercialización de estos, de estos productos crearon las naciones y los gobiernos nacionales. Eh, inclusive en los Estados Unidos era muy predominante la creación de, de comodidades y también de exportarlos. So, when I say commodity, you all think you know what it means and you're, you probably know most of what it means. But commodities, the basic definition is that they're things. But the most important definition is that they're fungible. Fungible. So in other words, when you, when you put gasoline in your car, you don't say to yourself, I want some of that good West Texas light crude, or I want some of that Saudi Arabian light crude, or North Sea. You have no idea. So the role of commodities and their fungibility is important for understanding the Western Hemisphere. Moreover, even though there are different commodity prices, Commodity prices tend to move together. So Peru is a major producer of copper. Canada is a major producer of asbestos. Both those things go into home building. So when home building shrinks, the prices of both copper and asbestos drop. So even though they're two radically different products, their price movement is connected. And it's commodities that link Local history to global history more than anything else. La producción de estas commodities que son productos cómodos por su por su función son mercancías y su exportación tiene que ver mucho con entender la historia global porque porque se tiene que ver estas commodities las mercancías como cosas como cosas funcionales y que su precio globalmente puede cambiar y puede variar y esto puede eh, indicarnos mucho acerca del proceso global que, que está sucediendo y eh, estas mercancías están eh, directamente eh, conectadas en lo que en, tanto en estos pequeños espacios como en un nivel global. So this leads us to the next thing, which is consumption. And people don't often think about consumption when they think about global history. They think about production. But if we think about transnational or multinational brands, right? You know, trans like Apple, Coke, Nike, or even brands that were, these brands had to become transnational, multinational. But Google and Facebook 
were created specifically to be that. Throughout the history of the Americas, what we see is that first elites took the profits they made and they tried to copy European consumption. In Brazil, it was very much about being like the French in the 19th century. But the growth of the middle classes, particularly beginning in the 1920s, meant that there was a sense of wanting that no insult to anyone, looking at, you could all be my students. You dress the same way my students dress. This started in the 20s with women in the so-called flapper culture, the marketing of cosmetics to women. And certainly in terms of household goods and things like cars after World War II became markers of middle class identity throughout the hemisphere. El, el consumo tiene que ver eh, con lo global, porque, por ejemplo, tenemos que observar estos, estos dos ejemplos, ¿no? la redonda eh, Nosotros vemos, por ejemplo, marcas como Apple, Coca-Cola, Nike, que la diferencia con otras marcas es que estas marcas han tenido que volverse globales para poder abarcar eh, nuevos mercados. En cambio, hay marcas como Google o Facebook que fueron creadas para que sean globales. Eh, a través de la historia de las Américas, eh, las élites se, eh, se han conlindado con, con estas mercancías para exportar eh, en el consumo. Para, eh, han creado estas este, mercancías para exportarlas y para crear un mayor consumo. ¿no? Eh, y eso tiene que ver también con el crecimiento de las clases medias que muchas veces intentan imitar a, a las clases altas. Entonces, eh, el consumo ayuda a estas clases medias a poder eh, imitar la forma de maquillarse, la forma de vestirse, y eso inclusive lo podemos ver ahorita en el auditorio para el profesor, porque para él nosotros eh, somos como sus alumnos porque nos vestimos exactamente como sus alumnos en la universidad donde él enseña, ¿no? y eso es parte del consumo de, de la globalización. So, for example, you're wearing a shirt that says Jack Daniels on it. It's an American whiskey. But I would have a student who studied in Peru or in Argentina or Brazil and they would wear a t-shirt with the name brand or something from Peru, right? So there's this, it's part of a kind of identity as students, right? That you have, or as people who travel, and people who consume things, culture and things. So when we connect the middle classes in the hemisphere, we see that things and culture play a big role of creating these identities. The car was a very obvious example from the post-World War II period, but as I said, notions of middle class and elite womenhood since the flapper culture of the 1920s. And certainly movies and television play this role. So I'm in a hotel here in Lima and I turn on the television and it's primarily shows from the United States that have been dubbed. But by the way, my cable at home has four channels in Spanish because we have a very large Spanish-speaking population in America. And my home state, Brazil, uh, Massachusetts, has a very large Brazilian population. So we can get television from Brazil on our cable for the, for the people uh, who speak Portuguese. I would also argue that even racial identities have been marked from the colonial time in transnational ways. And we can see that when we think about slavery and the role of slavery. And I know Peru did not have a lot of African slavery, but it had some. And almost every country in the Americas where there were profitable extractive materials, there were African slaves. Creando la clase, el género y la raza con las cosas, con los objetos eh, que son comerciados eh, a través del consumo. Eh, lo que conecta a la clase media de este hemisferio es el consumo de esta clase de mercancías, de esta clase de cosas. Eh, para el profesor, eh, el carro es el más uno de los más claros ejemplos de esto eh, desde 1945 para adelante. E inclusive las nociones de la clase media o inclusive de eh, la, las mujeres de la elite ah, ha sido transnacional por, desde eh, la noción que se crea de las flappers en 1920, esta clase de mujeres que usaban vestidos o holgados, que no resaltaban tanto su feminidad, creo que deben, deben conocer esta, estas chicas, ¿no? Eh, que se dedicaban a bailar o no estaban tan conectadas con su feminidad o algo parecido. Una de las, creo que es conocido como una de las primeras revoluciones de la mujer.
dentro de la oposición o de la forma de vestir. Eh, e inclusive también se tiene que considerar este, las películas de Hollywood, eh, los objetos crean identidades eh, dependiendo de la tendencia. E inclusive las, este, las identidades raciales también pueden eh, ser hemisféricas desde el periodo colonial um, a través de la, de la abolición de la esclavitud y de eh, el, la, la lucha por lo, eh, los derechos civiles, eh, los derechos en, en India y otros movimientos étnicos. So, so what's the point of thinking globally about the Americas? Obviously, each country in the Americas, and I, I come from a very big country, and I study a very big country. They have their own histories. Regionally, they have their own histories. I'm from New England. I have a very different view of people, the people in the South. In Brazil, I live in Sao Paulo. I have a very different view of Brazil than people who live in Amazonia or in the Northeast. But the idea of tying the Americas together is a very old idea. And since I'm not going to ask you to translate this, but in 1932, the president of the American Historical Association gave a speech in Canada to a bunch of American historians specifically saying that it made no sense not to study the Americas as a whole. And in that speech in 1932, he invoked the name of your university. He said that a series of universities were founded in the 16th and 17th century. I, I'll, I could read, the, don't, you don't have to translate the quote. But he said, governments were set up, cities rounded, religious institutions perpetuated, schools and colleges begun. The universities of Mexico and Lima date from 1551. The Jesuit College of Quebec, ancestor of Laval, from 1635. Harvard from 1636. William and Mary from 1695 and Yale from 1701. So here is an American in Canada talking to American historians almost 100 years ago, invoking the name of San Marcos in the same breath that he invokes the name of Harvard and the oldest university in Canada to say that the process of making the Americas has always been in unison, even though some was French, and some was English, and some was Spanish, and some was Portuguese. And what really happened is that as universities grew, this university grew in the 1960s and 70s, we started to have faculties that we put into what we say silos, right, into each group. And then, preceding that, was the Cuban Revolution, when the US government spent millions of dollars to, as we say, prevent another Cuba. And so they funded area studies. So people like me become Latin Americans. It doesn't matter that I publish in Brazil, I'm a Latin Americanist, and other people are Americanists. And Canadians are very, very worried about this project because they always feel they're going to be steamrolled by the United States because we're so much bigger and more powerful. But the idea here is that everything in academia has pushed us away from being together. And a perfect example of that is everything that's been great in history in the last 30 years, really good studies of race and class and gender and sexuality, are all about saying that history I learned about Peru or Argentina or the United States, about elite white men doing this thing, going this path towards the future, ignores all the struggle and all the complexity and the role of women and the role of people of color and the role of people with less power. And so that's been very important. But because people have been doing this important thing, they've been ignoring the broader perspective of the global context. Thank you. Eh, ¿Por qué deberíamos pensar eh, las Américas de una forma global? Eh, las naciones en las Américas han sido eh, distintas, pero han estado conectadas a través de una historia o de un conjunto de historias. Y puede ser una idea antigua pero ha, ha, sido derivada, ha sido derivada o dejada de lado por un dramático crecimiento de, de, la, de la academia eh, desde 1960 y en los 70. Eh, lo, profesor, lo que quiere decir con esto es que podemos estar cayendo en un problema si dividimos tanto los estudios y no consideramos a todas las Américas como un conjunto, como algo global. Eh, el aumento de los estudios de área 
eh, particularmente después de 1959 con la Revolución Cubana, han profundizado estas divisiones entre las regiones y entre todo, dentro de toda la hemisferia. Eh, es importante tener en eh, consideración las intervenciones en la historiografía eh, que están remarcando estas diferencias. ¿no? Eh, dejar de pensar que eh, eh, se tiene que tomar solamente en cuenta la historia del hombre blanco, de la elite, de la clase alta y lo que hizo él dentro de la historia, lo que hizo en las colonias. Eh, a pesar de que estas clases de estudios son importantes, no se puede dejar de lado eh, consideraciones como la raza, el papel de la mujer, eh, el género, la clase, y eh, se tiene que reescribir estas este, historias nacionales teniendo en consideración que las Américas son algo global. So we have had recent innovations, global histories of commodities, famous one by Sven Becker on top. But their focus is so broad that it's hard to understand what's actually going on in the world. Also works on racial and ethnic diasporas are significant, but they ignore the uniqueness of certain parts of the world, such as the Americas. So the world focus has given rise to the critiques of world history or global history that I mentioned earlier, that they do too much because they have a tendency to flatten the small spaces to kind of make any place that produces cotton or any place that produces soybeans or sugar or coffee to be too similar. And I'm not arguing that. Eh, las recientes innovaciones dentro de los estudios eh, lo, de la globalización están que eh, las historias de estas mercancías de comodidades a nivel global, tanto como el, el trabajo acerca del, del algodón por eh, Swen Beckett, eh, son innovadoras, pero eh, los límites de, de este foco mundial eh, es, le están prestando importancia a la hemisferia. Eh, los trabajos en lo racial o en, lo, en las diásporas, en las separaciones raciales y étnicas, también son importantes, pero ignoran eh, lo único que pueden llegar a ser las Américas. Eh, So I mentioned Herbert Bolt, The Epic of Greater America. This was the speech that I quoted a little bit from. So that's the spirit I'm trying to embrace, globalizing the Americas. We do have a series of American historians who for the first time are saying, you can't understand the United States without being global. And I'm not saying they're neo Boltonians, but a small number of scholars, and I include myself, are embracing Bolton's call for studying the Americas. The most interesting of them is Gerard Bouchard, who has this book called Genis des Nations et Cultures des Nouveaux Mondes that pairs specifically his home province of Quebec with Latin America and thinks that Quebec should always be analyzed as part of Latin America. There's also a young scholar who worked with him, Maurice de Meuse, who's written a wonderful book on the connections between the far right Catholic Church in Quebec and the right wing church in Mexico during the 1920s and thirds. So what Bouchard is saying is that if you look at Canada, you see all these things we think of in Latin America. And I would add to that, we see those in the United States as well. Eh, la globalización en las Américas, eh, el profesor toma a estos historiadores, como Eric Ratchway y Thomas Bender, eh, han llamado por una más eh, global conexión de los Estados Unidos con el resto de Latinoamérica. Eh, pero no son neo-boltonianos. Eh, hay un menor número de académicos que, eh, por así decirlo, toman más en cuenta eh, a la, el llamado de Bolton para estudiar más a las Américas. Eh, Gerard Bouchard, en este libro con título en francés, eh, considera que a Quebec se le tiene que tener en cuenta como parte de Latinoamérica. ¿no? Eh, Buchar conecta la historia de la iglesia, eh, la producción de mercancías, eh, el estado, eh, la producción del Estado y el colonialismo en partes de Canadá como en Latinoamérica para tener en consideración eh, que esto es muy importante que el profesor recalque que no puedes entender eh, Norteamérica eh, sin tenerlo en cuenta como algo global. So 
This is the last slide for those of you who were. So my work is like Bouchard's, it's inspired by Bolton's call. I'm embracing a hemispheric gaze to connect the small spaces and the local histories to the broader interconnected places. And my work aims to be a global history that is at the same time local and regional and global without having to be planetary. And so the goal is to rescue local and national and regional histories from the parochialism, from saying, I only understand this portion of Peru. I only know Amazonian Peru. I don't really want to know about the highlands. To get away from that level of specificity and narrowness, but at the same time to avoid letting global history become so broad that we flatten it out and we lose any sense of historical process and all those, little, those local spaces. Eh, descubriendo de nuevo las Américas en el trabajo del profesor eh, los años 20 de lo global eh, igual que Richard pero diferente de los neovoltianos es eh, inspirar esta llamada a que los estudios eh, dejen de ser tan divididos y que las Américas sean considerados como algo global el profesor eh, toma muy en cuenta a la división del de este hemisferio eh, para conectar diferentes lugares y las historias locales incluyendo el análisis de la raza, de la clase, del género, de la sexualidad eh, para eh, poder eh, presentar un proceso más interconectado eh, en su trabajo eh, llama a, a los estudios locales, regionales, globales eh, pero eh, tampoco llegando a pensar que lo global tiene que ser algo planetario eh, la, la meta final es rescatar la historia local, nacional, regional eh, y al mismo tiempo eh, evitar haciendo una historia global como les dije que sea tan grande eh, que, que se vea como algo planetario demasiado grande que sobrepasa a lo global I think that the, the, the thing about social work is that, you know, social workers are people who work for the government, right? Yeah. yeah. Is that a lot of that has to do with um, specific governments, but a lot of social work in American universities is tied to the uh, Department of Psychology. And so social work and psychology go hand in hand. So if you were to do, if someone from San Marcos came to UMass to work in social work, you would probably be in the psychology department. And that would be that would maybe be the most interesting part of it because the public policy part doesn't have a lot of value. I mean, what the Commonwealth of Massachusetts does or the U.S. federal government does doesn't really apply to Lima or to Peru. But certainly the psychology and the advances in, and and the research methods people do that would probably be very. And you consider it could be important for a professor in social work in your university interested to. To know the experience in Lima. Sure. Yeah. Well, also, I mean, the thing is that, so in the United States, we have one city of 8 million people, that's New York. But the other large cities are very spread out. So there aren't many cities in the United States that have the experience of Lima or Sao Paulo or Mexico City. And I think it would be very, very helpful for Americans to kind of see that. Uh, urban congestion. One of the issues in the United States is a lot of poverty, even urban poverty is starting to spread out, uh, maybe a little bit like the, the periferia in Latin America. And then that's leading to all different other problems. So, yeah, I think it would be very bad. Professor Maldonado le estaba preguntando aquí al ponente si habría algún interés, sobre todo porque él menciona la importancia de los estudios acerca de la mujer, como hay muchas estudiantes de trabajo social aquí que son mujeres. Eh, si alguno de ustedes, eh, si sería para la universidad donde trabaja el profesor conveniente que uno de ustedes vaya ahí a estudiar o cómo es la experiencia para un estudiante de trabajo social estudiar ahí. Y el profesor dice que la facultad de trabajo social ahí es muy buena, es muy amplia y sobre todo eh, él piensa que sería interesante ver cómo eh, las trabajadoras sociales se desenvuelven más en el campo de la psicología porque en Estados Unidos... Eh, tanto se trabaja para el Estado mismo, las trabajadoras sociales, eh, pero sobre todo está más amplio el, el campo de trabajo para las trabajadoras sociales en ámbitos de psicología o departamentos 
eh, de psicología. ¿no? Eh, y para el profesor cree que sí, sería muy interesante eh, ver un intercambio entre trabajadoras sociales de ya lo que quisiera hacerle presente a las chicas de trabajo social es que el tema de la migración, de la migración es muy importante porque Europa y Norteamérica tiene una migración multicultural. Por lo tanto, si tú a tu estudio de trabajo social le agregas el manejo de una lengua indígena y un desarrollo en etnografía y antropología, eso va a hacer que tu perfil como trabajadora social sea muy global. ¿no? pensando no en Lima solamente, ¿no? tú puedes estar en Lima, pero ¿por qué no trabajar en México? ¿por qué no trabajar en Canadá? ¿por qué no trabajar en otro país? Repito, el trabajo social es una actividad bisagra en este momento que hay enormes flujos migratorios que se ven todos los días por televisión. Claro, el estudio de inglés sería imprescindible para esto. ¿no? Gran parte de las chicas de aquí creo que son de tercer año quinto año, entonces vean, en el posgrado mmm, no sería muy difícil hacer su posgrado en Lima, Perú, en la San Marcos, de ser un semestre de posgrado en otra universidad. Hay casos, tenemos chicas de posgrado aquí que hacen un semestre en la UBA o en México y en otra universidad. La Universidad de Massachusetts, Anger, tiene una peculiaridad que es pública, a diferencia de otras muy conocidas como Harvard, como Mid, y San Marcos es pública. Entonces, eh, mm, a veces uno piensa que su carrera lo limita, está solo en Lima, en Perú, pero en este caso es muy flexible el ámbito, pero depende en gran parte de ustedes ¿no? que tengan esta perspectiva de este horizonte, ¿no? porque es en este siglo, el siglo XXI, que los flujos migratorios hacen muy importante el cuidado, atención y seguimiento a esta población para que se relacione con la población local, por ejemplo en España. En España, la gran migración africana hace que las trabajadoras sociales tengan mucho interés en la cultura africana. Bien, eh, Joel, uh, uh, your, the idea de tu lecture es uh, referente a lo de Sebastián Conrad. Sebastián Conrad participó en el seminario eh, two years ago y um, the other college, ¿no? Pero, yo les pregunto, ¿qué es la más prolífica historiografía sobre el global approach? in German, in Britain, in Canada, in, in the country, in Australia, what is your idea in this approach, you know, the global transnational approach more pro prolific in this moment? Why is it prolific? In what uh, university, oh. in what school? I don't know the answer to that. I, I, think, um, I think the most interesting work is being done outside the United States for some of the reasons that I talked about. I think that in the United States there, there are two problems. One is that um, people from the United States are very parochial and they see the world through their eyes and they're not comfortable seeing it through other eyes. So their focus is on the United States. And I think secondarily people who don't do that, I mean I'm not one, I study Latin America, but we're in the silos of Latin America. Africa, different parts of Asia. And so I think that I think that the most interesting take on this has come from Great Britain and Germany because um, in part because for bad reasons, that people aren't reading a lot of British history the way they used to, and they're not reading a lot of German history, which sent them to focus mostly on the Nazis in World War II. And so the historians of these countries are starting to ask broader questions. And so I don't no, there, there are some universities in, this, in the United States. Johns Hopkins University has a very strong, always has had a global history perspective. It started in the 1970s with a man named Philip Curtin talking about tropical history and try, trying to draw the tropics together. And there are a few other major departments that just have enough people that do it. But I do think that the impetus for it comes from Europe. solamente con sus ojos y solamente desde su perspectiva y desde nada más que eso 
eh, los estudios. Entonces, por eso él cree que eh, es más interesante ver los casos en Gran Bretaña y en Alemania, porque están abriendo más preguntas eh, acerca de lo que pasó después de la Segunda Guerra Mundial o lo que pasó después de, de los nazis. ¿no? Entonces, él considera que eh, el, el, un foco eh, está fuera de Estados Unidos y no dentro de Estados Unidos. Eh, Joel, do you consider it possible to uh, uh, approach, uh, connect the South America with the state, for example, the slavery? The slavery is a common topic between the state yeah. and South America. Uh, the other topic, uh, fishing. The other topic, the labor history. Right. No? For example, uh, studying in art church and king in Lima and archive in Boston. It's, uh, it's easy for a foreign historian to uh, find resources in American archive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of the benefits, I'll do air quotes, benefits, good sides to imperialism is that Great Britain and the United States collected a tremendous number of materials from Latin America. So I wrote a book on the place of the car in Brazilian history, thinking about automobility and transforming the nation. And there were more magazines, Brazilian cultural magazines, at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. than there were at the Biblioteca Nacional in Rio de Janeiro. So the fact of the matter is because the United States and Great Britain are rich and imperial, they have sent people down to collect materials from all over the world. I, they might have an office here. The US Library of Congress has a massive office in Rio de Janeiro, and they collect materials and books from all over the world. So it's oftentimes easier for, the best example, the single best archive for doing Mexican history is the Arquivo General in Mexico City. The second best archive is on the campus of the University of Texas at Austin. There's, there's no place in Mexico other than the National Archives that has as much as that. So yes, I think anyone who wanted to do a global history, whether it was Peru, I know many of you probably you read Paul Gutenberg's work on Guano. He did a tremendous amount of research in the United States and in Great Britain on Guano as much as he did research uh, here in the So yes, and it's, it's, a, it's a product of imperialism. El profesor Maldonado pregunta acerca de cómo podemos eh, acercar eh, eh, Latinoamérica a los estudios eh, de historia global de Estados Unidos y nuestro ponente eh, piensa que sí, es muy posible porque, por ejemplo, eh, la biblioteca del Congreso en Río de Janeiro eh, tiene una vasta cantidad de, de fuentes históricas para poder eh, realizar estudios, eh, por ejemplo, eh, él menciona un lugar en México que es este, un archivo, muchas, muchas fuentes acerca de temas de colonialismo en México, eh, que sería, la, por así decirlo, el primer lugar al que tienes que ir para hacer investigaciones históricas acerca de temas de colonialismo en México, pero el segundo lugar está en una universidad en Texas. Entonces, las fuentes están tanto en México como en Texas, entonces esa es la forma de poder acercar los estudios de Latinoamérica y de Estados Unidos acerca de historia global. Y él menciona el caso de este historiador Paul Gutenberg acerca del guano, ¿no? que él no solamente trata este, este tema, sino también temas de eh, Gran Bretaña. Entonces, para él sí es posible que se haga esta conexión entre Latinoamérica y Estados Unidos para los estudios de historia global. Uh, uh, Joel, uh, for example, two years ago, when UNAM in Mexico uh, proposed, no? UNAM in Mexico, same some projects, the last year of so, the graduate study, the UNAM in Mexico, and we same some projects, uh, the last year of the graduate study, no? the colleagues in UNAM read the Lima projects, um, in Lima read the Mexican project. I don't know if it could be interesting for your department, but uh, a proposal could be uh, we can exchange some historical project, the undergraduate study, mm -hmm. the Lima and Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and to, to share knowledge, to share the uh, approach, and to develop. Mm -hmm. you know? Absolutely. I, I told uh, Hector earlier that 
in the history department, we have five people who study Latin America one way or the other. And two of them study the Andes. One studies Bolivia, and the other studies colonial greater Peru. And then in our Spanish department, we have a scholar of colonial Peru. So we have a number of people who are working in this area. In fact, I have a colleague who right now is in, he's in Supe, in Bolivia right now. And so there is a, there's a tremendous interest in that, absolutely. And the, the two tracks we have, well, we have three tracks in Latin America. We have Caribbean, US, we have Brazil, and we have the Andes. So, um, and the people who do the Caribbean in the US and people who do Brazil certainly could participate in this. But the people who do the Andes would be very, very interested and um, would already be familiar with working in, in Lima and, and probably even here. Eh, el profesor Maldonado le estaba comentando que hace unos dos años eh, se hizo un intercambio de proyectos de investigaciones entre alumnos de la Universidad de la UNAM y alumnos de San Marcos. ¿no? Entonces le preguntaba a nuestro ponente si era posible que se haga este intercambio de proyectos de investigación pero con alumnos suyos. ¿no? Y nuestro ponente cree que sí, sería algo muy interesante porque cinco de sus alumnos eh, tratan temas de Latinoamérica de la, de la historia en Latinoamérica y uno de ellos trabaja un tema en Bolivia eh, eh, y otro tema de Perú, el colonialismo eh, aquí en el Perú entonces él cree que sí, eh, sería posible hacer un intercambio de proyectos de investigación eh, no, eh, ¿Tienen alguna interrogante, algún comentario? It's a great question. Um, so, before I answer that, what I'll say is a similar thing happened in Brazil. That in Brazil, Brazil had a very long dictatorship, 21 years, 1964 to 85. And so historians were always very broad and not very specific. So after the dictatorship, when archives opened up, they buried down into the archives and they were super local. It was everything was just exactly what happened in Sao Paulo this month during the dictatorship. And I think that as good as it was to have that really tightly done history, you didn't lose the context. So for a student who wants to do both what you're trained to do, but to also be global, I think the idea there is to pick sometimes a person or a product that is here in Lima, or was here in Lima, but that was dependent on other things in the world. So a merchant, understanding how a merchant actually behaved and how that merchant and his family, including his wife, how they had connections to people in Paris and Frankfurt and New Orleans and New York, and to go through those things. Um, I think that's a way to be both local and to be broad. So there are some works, there are a couple on Mexico that are about, there's one a friend of mine wrote on um, a plantation that grew vanilla. And almost all the vanilla is exported. And he does an excellent job of showing the relationship between what's going on in this plantation and the markets abroad. And finally, there's a book, it may be in Spanish, John Solori, S-O-L-U-R-I, wrote a book called Banana Cultures. And it's the only book I've ever read on a commodity that also deals with the consumption of the commodity. So it's primarily about Honduras and 
production in Honduras. It's a labor history. It's an environmental history. But it's also a history of foreign consumption of Honduran bananas. So it's John Sawori Banana Cultures. I don't, I don't know if it's going to gran pregunta, ¿no? Y él empieza dando un ejemplo acerca de lo que pasó en Brasil. Eh, durante la dictadura, los historiadores eh, no eran muy específicos en sus trabajos, pero cuando acaba esta dictadura, eh, eh, sí terminan siendo un poco más específicos, eh, delimitando mejor el tema como nosotros lo hacemos ahora, ¿no? Y entonces lo que él recomienda es elegir una persona, un personaje en específico o un producto eh, que se pueda estudiar eh, de cómo depende de los procesos alrededor, no solamente en el Perú, un producto en el Perú, sino eh, cómo se relaciona con otros procesos que estaban sucediendo al mismo tiempo en otras partes de, de las Américas, ¿no? lo que llama las Américas. Eh, y él menciona dos trabajos, eh, uno en México acerca de la vainilla y otro acerca del banano, que son muy específicos acerca de estas eh, commodities que vimos, estas mercancías, ¿no? y esos estudios empiezan desde ahí, pero no dejan de tomar en cuenta los procesos que hay alrededor suyo. By the way, the guy who wrote about vanilla, Emilio Curí, with another, yeah, from fucking Puerto Rico. <laughs> ¿Tienen alguna otra interrogante, comentario? I really like your idea about your project, but maybe this is the short version. So I don't know if you are putting about the social issues on Peru or all South America, because maybe uh, you say people tend to think that we are all similar, uh, we don't have different problems here, but I mean, like feminism is being heard in Argentina and Chile, but not in Peru, in Peru is less. So I think that uh, you say, uh, is making a development about feminism right now in USA, of course. But here in Peru it's different, but through the internet we are learning, well, at least I am learning about feminism, and also in Argentina and Chile, but because of the social um, networks, uh, we can see it. But I don't know if in your project is that kind of things. So that's a great question. I don't know if you want to translate it further. Yeah, okay. if you want. My Spanish is terrible. So, so to answer your question, in my book about the 1920s, I find, of course, a lot of difference. And I think the biggest example is that you have different political systems, right? And so, for example, one of the issues in Brazil is that there was never a civil rights movement by Afro-Brazilians because the vote didn't matter. So what, you know, in the United States, it was about the vote. Um, I think that there are times at which there's a tremendous amount of similarity, and I think consumption is one of those. But I think you're right, that social movements and social mores are very specific to individual histories. So this is beyond my, my book, which is about the 1920s. But I have a colleague at UMass who's uh, Cubana, raised in the States, but she studies Brazil. And she wrote a wonderful book on the rise of feminism in Brazil around the transition to democracy in the late 70s and 1980s. And one of the things she found is that a lot of ideas about feminism were brought back to Brazil by women who were in exile during the dictatorship. They were in exile, so women during the military dictatorship who fled the country. But they went to, to the United States, they went to, they went to Paris, to London, to San Francisco, to New York, and when they came back to Brazil, they brought these ideas, but they made them Brazilian, right? And so if you're, so you might find that in Chile, you might find that in Argentina, but you probably wouldn't find it in Colombia, Venezuela, Peru, Ecuador, right? Because you don't have that experience. And then a question that I don't know the answer to, but I think I do, is what is the impact on Mexico of the United States? So right now in the United States, we have a number of television networks that are all in Spanish. For years, the Mexican government controlled the media, but they couldn't control what was being broadcast in Spanish from the United States. And so many Mexicans go back and forth. So I think that, again, Mexico is unique because you have this exchange of people constantly. And you could never say that was, that was true about, you know, well, Peru, right? There's just, there are Peruvians who go back and forth, but it's a lot, I, I flew here, it's a lot more work to go from Lima to New York than it is to go from Mexico to Houston, 
or Mexico to Los Angeles, right? So I think you're exactly right. I think that the, the trick of this book is to show what are the processes where there's similarities and there really is this, ah, the Americas, and say, wait a minute though, Peru and Ecuador border, but they're really different places, even places that are that close. But to me, the most obvious, I study Brazil, right? And Brazil is so different from, from Argentina in so many ways. So it's a, it's a fantastic question. I like your t-shirt. <laughs> Thank you.